Welcome back, folks. This is episode five of the Human Performance Outliers podcast, and I'm here with my co-host, Sean Baker, and our first official guest, um, Peter Ballerstedt. So we've got an exciting podcast interview to kind of start things off with the interview side of stuff. Um, Peter is uh, someone who spends a lot of time looking into kind of sustainable farming and livestock and, and things of that nature. And I know I've got some questions about that type of stuff, uh, as well as many other people do as we kind of move forward as more or less a human race and try to decide like, you know, what do we do with the resources we have? How do we make them last and, uh, um, you know, be sustainable for future generations? So uh, I, I welcome uh, Peter as our first guest. How's it going, Peter? It's going very well, Zach. And, and Sean, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. It's quite an honor. Um, my background is in agriculture. And I came to low-carbohydrate uh, dietary approach to treating the, you know, 51-year-old, balding, pre-diabetic, obese individual I had become uh, starting in 2007. Um, and, and then I kind of got to roll back into everything that I was trained in the way of forage agronomy, ruminant nutrition. And I hope I can just be a bridge between these seemingly disparate worlds, but I think they're really well connected because I think a lot of the myths from the human nutrition realm have been deployed against ruminant animal agriculture. So it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting stuff, and I think um, you know, everyone probably listening knows or maybe does some farming or gardening and stuff like that. So they probably have like a you know a general idea of just you know agriculture and like what the current kind of landscape is that. But you know, I when I look into it, I think there's oftentimes. Uh, a lot of ways to kind of do a shallow dive into kind of what's going on and then like with anything nowadays there's so much information out there uh, I think a lot of times people fall into that kind of like do a shallow dive and then move on to something else so then you kind of end up like not necessarily connecting all the dots so having an, someone who's got some some expertise in the area I think will be will be valuable um, Sean how about you how you've been doing me? Oh, I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun playing on social media and just kind of staying busy here. Hey, Peter, I've got, I'm just going to, I'm just going to bust out a couple quick questions here, Peter. Um, you know, one of the things that I sort of get a lot, because obviously, you know, as you know, I'm a big proponent of including meat in the diet. And for some people, it's an all meat diet like myself. I know Zach has been playing with that periodically. And, and I know you have even done some of that stuff as well. And, you know, there's a lot of confusion about, you know, farming practices, particularly when it comes to cattle, and we have this thing called the factory farm, which is demonized, and we talk about CAFO meat being awful, and there's all these horrible things that are happening, and I, it's my impression that, you know, uh, I don't think it's all black and white, I think there are, you know, every confined animal feeding operation is not identical to the other one, there's a, there's a picture out there that these animals are being tortured and crammed into cages and covered in filth, and I know you get out there and you actually see these animals, I assume, and you're, you've been around this stuff for, for years. And can, what can you tell me about how these animals are treated, how they're kept? Is there differences from what we're being told from the propaganda stuff or what's really going on out there? Sure. Um, I, I think it's really important for people to recognize that we have – People don't like the idea of food and business being put together. Like somehow the people that are working hard to produce food for us aren't entitled to make a living wage from the exercise. Um, I, I think that's a whole other conversation that we could have. But we know that stress is bad for the human being, right? And, and, and we're aware of how that can manifest itself and harm human health. Stress for animals is equally harmful. And people who are trying to make a profit raising livestock are going to great lengths to minimize stress. Um, I think that it's absolutely true that there are 
belief systems and narratives that want to exaggerate problems in order to make a point. I think like in any other human endeavor, you can find good and bad examples. And I think the industry is trying to police itself because it recognizes that the bad problems need to, you know, the bad producers, when they're identified, need to be dealt with. Um, but at the end of the day, we're talking about um, the production of animals for human consumption. And for many people, that's just a, 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 they can't accept that reality. So there are these other issues that come up. I, I just want to make it really clear because it came up. I just saw it yesterday. Um, some people are confused about what I do for a living. <laughs> and, and what I do for a living isn't, I, I do not work for the meat industry. I, I work on the forage side of the ruminant animal agriculture. So I, I in that sense, I support ruminant animal agriculture, but uh, I work in the seed industry. So what I do get to do is try to talk to the beef industry, the dairy industry, small ruminants, and say, look, the, the product of your effort can actually plausibly play a role in reversing the unsustainable epidemic of chronic illness that we're facing in this country and worldwide. And I also make the case that if we're going to feed the nine and a half billion people in 32 years, the diet that we believe is more appropriate, then we're going to have to improve our ruminant animal agriculture systems. So that's kind of an introduction. I think part of the, part of the challenge that we have in agriculture is the vast majority of people really, just to push back a little bit on your point, um, they, they're at least three generations removed from the reality of living on a farm. Um, the, the line that I picked up along the way is that the average American today is more likely to have direct personal experience with the criminal justice system than with production agriculture. And it's, it's actually, there's actually more people listed, and this was a few years ago, but there were slightly more people listed by Department of Justice as being incarcerated, local, state, and federal, than there were listed by USDA as primary operators of farms. And, and the problem with that statistic is all it takes to be a farm is to sell $1,000 worth of goods. So if you drill into that number a little bit further, they say that over 70% of that, those people make less than a quarter of their household income from their farm. So we could be more like four times. So it's, it's a very small number of people that are doing the work that provides the food that allows us to then do everything else that society gets to do when they don't have to be involved in, in producing their own food. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point. I know um, I always remember when I was in college, I took an environmental history course once, and they, were, they would always talk about um, this concept of modern society and how like, most people are kind of operating under this invisible hand pretense, and that goes for like, almost all consumption, not just food consumption, but you know, like you, you, you take for granted, like you flip a light switch on, the light comes on, or, you know, when you sit down to dinner, the food is right there and there's, you know, we're really experiencing kind of that, you know, like final touch of the process. Whereas it's, a, it's like you said, a very small group of people who are actually doing, um, that type of thing from step one to the final product. And, uh, you, when you look at some of the stuff, like I think, uh, the stat that I heard most recently was like 97% of of people in the United States do eat meat, um, you know, and probably in various amounts, but, uh, you know, that's essentially the majority or all of the people. Um, so like there's a pretty big disconnect, I think from, uh, people, what they're eating and how they kind of see that coming up because, 
you, you look at like what Sean was talking about, some of those pictures that you'll see posted about the factory farms and the mistreatment of animals. And, you know, you'd, you'd be hard to find anyone who would say, yeah, that's, that's great. I love that. Um, yeah. but you'd also be hard pressed to find someone who's not gonna, you know, eat meat at the end of the day. So it kind of puts us in an interesting, uh, uh, crossroads or conundrum, I guess. Well, and, and I think part of the, part of the challenge is what do you mean by that pejorative label? Right, factory farm, of mm -hmm. course. But what do you mean by that? Is it more perception or reality? And then the other thing that I would just offer is to say meat is to sort of gloss over whatever might be production differences between beef and lamb and other ruminant flesh and pork and poultry and aquaculture and, and any. So each of those have their own challenges everything we do in life has costs and benefits and if we're going to have a wise conversation about how we balance those then we need to sort of I think have a better understanding of what's actually involved so we're not going to go back to all being hunters and gatherers right yeah uh, so so okay given that then what um, and a balance against whatever our negative perceptions are and and the two of you are involved in sport at as your title says an outlier but today in the United States if I understand the statistics something like 200 people are going to have some part of their body cut off because of the standard of care for diabetes in this country and everywhere in the you know worldwide today every 30 seconds somebody's going to have a leg cut off due to diabetes and then I came across uh, again a posting that said that uh, the uh, pointed me to a paper where they said that the um, um, uh, I'm, I'm gripping for the word here and I've got a doctor that I'm talking to so that's really embarrassing uh, the prognosis for patients who start down that path is worse than for many types of cancer. So after the first, you know, amputation, then they're likely to die quicker than many types of cancer following diagnosis. So and and we're spending a billion dollars a day virtually just in the US just on diabetes care. So all of that I I posit is unsustainable. Yeah, I would agree with you on that, Peter. I mean, I, and, I, and as someone who has taken care of a lot of those diabetics and done those amputations and, and repeated amputations and cut off more fingers, toes, and legs than I'd ever care to, uh, either from doing it as a trauma surgeon in Afghanistan, but more and more, more uh, regularly as complications of diabetes and vascular disease. It's a horrible disease. Uh, it's progressive. It is. It's 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 probably worse than cancer in my view, as far as you know, as an overall picture. But. Um, let me, this one thing you said, you see, you know, I think it's very important to say we can't all go back to being hunter, hunters and gatherers. I know there's people out there saying, well, we should all hunt. Well, if we all became hunters, we'd quickly deplete the wild game population within about a year or two. I mean, I think there's only like 30 million deer in the U.S. running around. And if, if, if I think there's something like 17, 18 million are registered hunters in the United States. And so if we had every male, you know, say we got 120 million males out there hunting, we would run through our deer population within a few years, most likely. So that's not an option. So we have to we have to figure out how to feed ourselves. So one of the other things that's being talked about by guys like Bill Gates and uh, Richard Branson is, hey, we're going to just grow this meat in a in a factory. You know, we're going to take a, we're going to take a cell. We're going to we're going to add some uh, bovine serum, and we're going to grow these cells. And we're going to make you know a little. Uh, uh, meat burgers that we can sell and you guys can all eat that. What are the pros? What are the cons? What do you think the negative? Is there any negative consequence to that? Because we're being told that's, that's a win for the economy, for the environment, a win for health, and a win for the animals. What is, what is your opinion on that approach? And are there any sort of uh, things we need to be aware about before we go down that road? Uh, so before I launch, I just have one word to offer, and that's margarine. Uh, <laughs> We have this model that we've been told this would be a better product than that, and oops. Um, so, so, and and again, part of the justifying argument for the, you know, the 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 fake whatever it is, it's not meat. Um, well, 
I guess they're saying it would be because we're going to culture it. But what part meat isn't one tissue. So which tissue are you culturing? Um, and and so so there's that issue. There's the issue of now you're concerned about various businesses that are controlling your food supply. This seems like the ultimate concentration of control over your food supply. So that doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Uh, number three is that ruminant animals are absolutely essential to the function of the ecology in many spaces around the world, from the Arctic to the tropics, dry and moist tropics. We can find ruminants that humans have domesticated in every one of those biomes. And, and so what's going to happen to them? Uh, you can't just let them run loose. You can't let them overproduce. So you've got to manage them. Well, what does that look like? Um, and, and oh, by the way, today in the world, I think the figure is something like livestock represent $1.3 trillion in asset value worldwide. Yeah, I mean it's, it's it's obviously a huge industry. I mean, but I th I think there is a, you know I think some of the processed food injuries in industries probably represent more in income from what we're seeing. I, well, I would, yeah, yeah I, I forget how many billion people are involved in that process chain worldwide um, in terms of so in terms of employment, in terms of new wealth generation, all of that. You're going to you, the argument is that you're going to replace that with this laboratory process to create and 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 then what because a lot of um, poor smallholders are you know dependent on livestock as part of what they do um, and I I'm fundamentally distrustful of their argument because they're justifying it one on health grounds which we have reason to question, and two on environmental grounds, which we also have reason to question. Um, so it, it's hard for me to get really excited about something that seems more like a vested interest play in service of false narratives than the promise that they're holding out for it. Right, Peter. Just just to, just to summarize, you're saying they're they're out, they're in it for the money, and they're they're using the environmental argument to to sell that product. I think, and I think that's that's pretty clear to, to me and some others. Let me ask you a question about the environment because we have a lot of sort of things that cows are destroying the ozone layer, their methane production, and their their CO production. Can you tell us, you know, what's truth? Can we separate some fact from fiction? Can we tell? Can we? And then can we also talk about the things that may be problematic and how we can fix fix them potentially, and what we're doing, what the cat, what the uh, you know ruminant industry is doing to to improve things. Sure. Uh, part of the so if you hear people say that cattle produce more emissions than transportation, that's a common sort of claim. That stems from a UN report that was subsequently retracted, but people never sort of, you know, it's 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 like a lot of research literature. People cite the paper and don't realize that later it was retracted. Um, the the best figures for the United States that are that all of animal agriculture in the United States is something like four percent of total emissions. Beef is two percent. The healthcare industry is ten percent. <laughs> so um, there there's there's a line that we could go down there if we wanted to look at. But um, so so we have reason to question the emissions numbers that are coming out. We have reason to question the impact of those emissions numbers. And, and then we have to weigh the potential harm that people are talking about against the present harm. I just ran through the statistics about the current impact on human health. And we're going to compare that to what people are projecting some years down the road using models whose performance we have reason to question. So in, in, in that sense, put that on the one side of the scale. On the other side of the scale, 
we know that grasslands are one of the greatest sinks for carbon in our biosphere. We know that um, if uh, carbo, uh, sorry, that that cellulose is the most abundant carbohydrate in the biosphere. So cellulose and starch essentially are made up of glucose units. They're just linked together differently. The bond is sort of reversed. Um, and the impact of that is that obviously human beings can utilize starch, <laughs> um, but no vertebrate animal makes cellulase, the enzyme that breaks down those bonds to then liberate the glucose. So the ruminant animal plays a significant part of making that available. But if it weren't for the microbes that produce the cellulase that either live in the rumen or live out in the environment, and if that cellulose never got degraded, so the CO2 just kept getting fixed and kept getting fixed and never recycled to the atmosphere, and if photosynthesis didn't decline as that amount drew down, we would reach a point of stagnation within 25 years, 30 years, depending. So plant growth is absolutely dependent on CO2 level. And again, people have an image of CO2 as just being this poison and a pollutant when it's an absolutely essential natural trace gas that's fundamental to life on Earth. Um, be that as it may, we know that as we, that, that grasslands, as opposed to annual crops or soybeans, wheat, what have you, put more of their fixed carbohydrate below ground than those annual crops do. So if I have a grass stand and it's making a thousand pounds of dry matter available for a grazing animal to ingest, about a thousand pounds is down in the soil in the way of roots. And when that surface, so any any CO2 or carbon or methane that a ruminant animal is going to emit, a cow, a sheep, whatever, has to come from her food. Because she's not making carbon. Cows aren't alchemists. That was another line I came <laughs> across. So so, and, and for it to be in the food, it had to come from the atmosphere. And so about less than half of what the cow was going to eat from pasture, um, sorry, let me put that, try that again. Whatever the cow was going to eat from pasture, more than that would have been fixed as roots or leaf litter on the surface. And, and so, depending on the parameters that you put in the model, you can actually see that these grazing animals are going to be carbon negative. Again, against the narrative. Um, we're learning a lot as we go along. There's a big, uh, there's a growing awareness today in something that's called soil health. So people are saying now that the weight of soil organisms below the ground may be in excess of the weight of the cattle above the ground. But if we plow that ground, then we're going to harm those soil organisms. Uh, so, um, but as we we're, we're learning about the relationship between those plants, their roots, and the population of microbial and actually um, larger organisms within the soil uh, system. Um, so uh, we, we talk about the environmental impact, but we don't frequently have a big enough picture of what it is that we're talking about. <laughs> Go ahead, Zach. I don't want to keep asking all the questions. I've, I've got a lot of stuff I want to talk to Peter about, but you, I want you to have a chance. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries at all. It's, uh, I, I'm definitely trying to take mental notes. I'll have to listen to this one myself a few times just to make sure I catch everything. It's been uh, already a lot of information that's, I think, great food for thought. Um, I 
I think you kind of uh, kind of introduced a question I did have too, and uh, if we want to rewind back a little bit to that, like, well, as a society, it's going to be uh, hard, if not impossible, to like revert back to like a hunter gatherer society, and um, certainly not desirable for most. Uh, what what about like a scenario in which we would kind of restructure our agricultural approach to be more inclusive of the natural process with like um, yeah returning some of these monocropping fields to grazing fields so that like cattle can actually eat the way they were intended to eat and then like their their byproducts of what they're eating actually feeds back into the system as opposed to kind of harming the system, which is what we're sometimes led to believe with um, these mass monocropping and mass agri or cattle ranch type scenarios. Is that something that like you think is in the future if we're going to keep things sustainable? Um, and I mean, I think of things as, as simple as you know grazing cattle and potentially as complex as something like the Savory Institute where they're you know moving things around over various plots of land and rotating animals and crops in a in a uni in a way that's that's actually feeding back into the productivity as opposed to um essentially like raping the soil uh is that something that you see coming down i i think that we have the agricultural system we do because we have the dietary and agricultural policy that we do uh, so as we get some of these things sorted out, then I think we'll be able to see the changes. I think also there's no doubt that we have great potential within our grasslands and areas that could be cultivated grassland. And that's for better productivity, for better management. Um, that's clear. The, we have policies that also impact that that need to be sorted. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's more than just convincing farmers that they should make a change. Um, but I think that it's entirely likely down the road that what we'll end up seeing are more kinds of hybrid systems where we will continue to see the production of cereal crops or other vegetable crops or what have you and livestock being integrated into that either physically onto those fields at some time during the year or they'll continue to use the byproducts of those um, enterprises. So for example, um, if, if peop, uh, vegetable processing waste would be one example. You know, you can imagine that if you harvest a crop of vegetables, it's not just the vegetables that end up on the shelf that you get. You get a lot of stuff, culls or peels or, you know, parts of the plant that, that aren't intended or edible. Um, that all can either be disposed of as landfill or <laughs> composted or fed to animals. And I would rather see that go to animals uh, we can also see where, uh, for example, where I live in Western Oregon, we produce a lot of grass seed. Well, there's a time during the winter and early spring where we'll graze those seed fields. So now we have this integration uh, of livestock in a cropping system, and then there's also straw produced, and that gets fed to livestock. A similar thing happens with wheat production in the Great Plains, where in the wintertime you can graze wheat pastures and, and still end up with a wheat yield at the end. Um, so I, I think that we're going to continue to see the, the integration of livestock. I think one of the things we need to recognize is that in New Zealand they have the livestock systems that they do because of the amount of arable land that they have and they're being an export dominated agriculture so they've got to ship their products 5,000 miles to get them to market we can have people drive out to our farms if we choose um, you know we have a significant portion of the world's cropland in North America 
without having you know much of the world's population. So that is going to result in us having different agricultural systems. And we shouldn't get ourselves locked into particular images of what those should or shouldn't be without doing a thorough examination of all that that would imply. Because I, 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 I've been down that road. Um, I, um, I talk about grass-based agriculture because ruminant animal agriculture is grass-based regardless of how those animals ultimately are finished. And, and I've got, I'm, I'm very happy eating the beef that I can get from Safeway, just to name a supermarket sure. uh, and, you know, any particular one. Um, I will, you know, we've, we've eaten grass fed beef before. Um, and that's fine. It's, you know, it's, but I, I'm concerned about the health claims that are made. I'm concerned about the environmental claims that are made. Um, so, yeah, Peter, let me let me just two things. So, I mean, and I agree with you. I think from a uh, just from a taste pers perspective, I think the ones that are finished on grain for me taste better. I mean, I understand that there's a lot of people that see problems with that, um, and I agree. The whole, I think the health differences between the two are pretty much overblown. I don't think there's any real good data out there in human studies that show that grass fed, grass finished is any more beneficial than grain finished. I, I just I just don't see that data out there. I mean there's there's obviously small differences in, in different nutrient makeups, you know, the omega three to omega six ratios and so on and so forth. But I don't see that as a big deal. Uh, now what I do uh, two questions, you know, one of the things that we always hear from people that, that criticize the animal agriculture industry is that you know, let's look at soybeans, for instance. The soybeans, in, in from what I'm being told, soybeans are being grown almost exclusively to feed these animals. And my perception, from what I what I seem to understand, is soybeans are grown for various reasons, and the animals are again eating the the waste products from that production. Is that more or less true? Is it a hybrid between those two things? And then my second question is regarding methane production you know again we've had ruminant animals on the planet for you know maybe a hundred million years I mean if I, if I remember my zoology I think I think you know our ruminants started evolving around a hundred million years ago so we've had these big herds but you know if we talk about mitigating methane I know in Australia they, they, they found a, a plant an, an algal a red algae that is supposed to almost completely eliminate methane production is that feasible if we could figure out that chemical is it even necessary why would we need to do that so comment on you know just grains, crops, soybeans and stuff grown and why they're grown, how much how much is that is specifically grown only for the production of, of livestock, you know, particularly ruminants, and then and then comment on that little methane or met, methane in general if you don't mind. Okay, so so regarding the methane issue, um, methane is a natural product of the rumen fermentation process. That that as those microorganisms in an in an environment without oxygen are breaking down the carbohydrate and other elements of the, the feed, methane is one of the byproducts. Uh, ironically, um, the methane production under some grazing systems is actually greater than when those animals are in uh, a higher management feedlot environment. Um, again, contrary to, to the perception. Um, again, methane is something that it has many sources, both natural and man-produced. Um, we have been learning more and more. I have papers uh, that are demonstrating that where we used to think methane was only produced under waterlogged soils so that rice paddies are one of the most significant sources of, of methane. Uh, we, we're now realizing that we get methane produced from aerobic soils and that in fact living plants themselves can emit methane and that as that leaf litter on the surface decays it emits methane and termites and various other arthropods are significant sources of methane and then we have other uh, wild ruminants that also themselves emit methane. Um, but we are also learning that the turnover of methane in the environment is much quicker than we used to think. And then 
not to get too far off on it, but um, the behavior, the absorption behavior of methane in a mixed atmosphere, mixed gas atmosphere like the air, is very different than looking at the absorption behavior of methane in a pure environment in the laboratory. In other words, where methane absorbs energy happens to have been fully absorbed already by water vapor in the atmosphere. And so, again, people are concerned about something that may not pan out out in the environment. Uh, that's methane. Um, the, the, I, I wanted to cycle back to just uh, one point uh, about the differences between grass finished and grain finished meat. First of all, for cattle, three quarters of its life are going to be exactly the same regardless of that last finishing period. So that, that management is going to be identical, that animal up to the point where it either is going to continue to finish on grass or go into a higher energy feeding ration, the animal's been eating grass or suckling on mama, so it's all grass at that point. Uh, there are quantifiable differences between grass finished and grain finished meat. There, there's, there's no doubt about that. Where I question is the biological significance of those differences. And somewhere down the road, we may well find that some of those differences, we can now see what the biological significance of those are. But I think, and we've talked about this before, I think, that applying the 80-20 rule, <laughs> the most significant insult to human health today is hyperinsulinemia, it's the metabolic syndrome, those things. And, and for anyone to talk about omega-6 to omega-3 differences in beef leading to diabetes, which I've heard, <laughs> um, I, I, you're, you're way out over the tips of your skis on that one. I, there's just no way that that makes sense. Um, but you can even, you know, you could apply it to CLA content, right? What if, as some people are suggesting, we've been chasing the wrong model of cancer? And, and what if cancer, you know, and, and then you have to ask, well, how much CLA do you have to feed to a rat in a high dose, you know, to, and, and how does that translate then to human nutrition? So I, I think that we're still suffering from all the misdirection that comes from nutritional epidemiology. And we're trying to find, how did Adele Height put it, that, you know, we, we've been told we shouldn't eat meat, right? So we, but we really like to eat meat, right? And so we feel guilty for eating meat because we've been told not to. So if you can tell me a way to eat meat and not feel guilty, sold. And I think a lot of this is sort of fitting somewhere in, in that story. Yeah, I mean, as, as humans, we like to cope, and I think that makes a lot of sense where you can, for someone who is going to eat meat, and but in the back of their mind, that nags at them, like, oh, I'm eating this this uh, kind of artificially prepared scenario where we're feeding them food they maybe weren't otherwise eating to fatten them up. That, that, that gnawing in their mind can be kind of removed with saying, oh, well, this was a humanely treated grass-fed cow as opposed to a cow that was you know, sitting on a lot somewhere eating, you know, eating grain or something like that. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly interesting, interesting thoughts and stuff. So I would, I would just, you know, again, we, it's almost like we have to keep saying these things over and over again, even in a feedlot, mm -hmm. even at the end of the feeding period, because when you move animals into that, you can't just put them on, you know, what we, a very high concentrate content ration. So concentrate and roughages are two old descriptions of, of livestock feeds. And, and roughages were higher in fiber and lower in energy and vice versa. So when you move an animal into that, they're getting a lot of forage 
and a little bit of concentrate, and then you kind of adjust that as they go forward so that they can adjust to the feet. Even at the end of that period, that animal is still getting a significant part of its diet from forage. And of the concentrate that they're getting, the majority is not human utilizable. And over the course of its lifetime, even a steer that went through the whole commercial process, only 10% of its lifetime feed was grain. And so just to kind of reality check us a little bit, I mean, I know I've, I've talked to people who sincerely believe that beef cattle spend their entire life in a cage getting fed grain. And so, so when we have this degree of separation between reality, and, you know, the production reality and the consumer perception, we maybe need to kind of take a step back and just make sure that we understand what we're talking about. Yeah, Peter, I mean, sorry, Zach. Uh, Peter, I, you know, that's one of the things I think we have this, and I call it almost a Disneyification of how nature works. I mean, we have a whole generation that their closest contact with animals is maybe going to the zoo and then watching Disney films, and I think that's where we got this misrepresentation of what's actually going on. We, you know, and again, people think, yeah, people think that you know, cow feeding eating grains is being shoved in a cage and eating grains from the day it's born. You know, this is a, this is the sort of stuff we're hearing out in some of this uh, sort of, you know, alternate universe propaganda that comes out there. And I think that's something that people should go out and actually visit these farms and go see what actually happens. I mean, I think that would be very helpful for, for a lot of people. And, and what I, I'm just kind of, I just don't understand myself why the cattle industry isn't doing more to, uh, you know, promote their product, you know, as far as showing what's really going on, um, you know, and, and instead of letting, you know, some of these act activists, you know, dictate the dictate the narrative, because I think, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, a few where they do some YouTube videos, but it's, it's not much that's getting out there that's going to change the perception. Right. And, and, and I just had a thought of, you know, given Zach's, you know, ultra marathon distance running kind of thing. Uh, if I'm understanding things properly, our ecological niche was as endurance hunters, that we would run down large ruminants um, who could run faster than us but for only short periods of time before they'd have to stop and pant and try to dump heat and meanwhile we could continue to just kind of lope after them until Ultimately, these animals were dying of heat exhaustion. Well, okay, so that's natural. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Versus what we have today. So, you know, let's, uh, again, um, I, I, I think that um, we, we do have this issue, we, but we have to couple that with, there's, there's a darker perspective that's influencing a lot of the conversations as well because there are people who see no difference between human beings and animals or indeed bacteria or viruses and and they refer to human beings as a plague on earth or a cancer and this comes from a particular worldview that I think also needs to be opposed seriously because their perspective has led to some real crimes against human beings um, and that's a conversation that that we could have um, to the point about the industry and again I'm not employed in the industry I just want to make that clear I'm trying to talk to the industry about how do you so so um, if, if we go back far enough you know, way back to the late 70s and the early 80s when this was all being the, the dietary guidelines, the dietary goals, and then the dietary guidelines were being, you know, born. Um, the, the people who spoke against it were in many, well, they were the industry and also they were researchers who were working in various areas like protein, nutrition, and 
lipid nutrition and 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 what was available at the time and because they had accepted some small amount of money from the egg board for example or from whatever industry their arguments were ignored they were marginalized because they were from big meat right mm -hmm. well so it politically as we think about trying to bring about some change we probably don't want industry to out front in terms of funding or promotion or what have you lest that happen again but my argument to the industry is surely and I'm speaking entirely of, of talking about the beef industry surely your members your producers need to hear more up-to-date health information and they're trying in little ways but then they get significant pushback when they try so there was just a, um, uh, a, an article that came out where the Texas Beef Council put together a you know publication to go into doctors waiting rooms and doctors offices saying that beef belongs in the diet of your high cholesterol patients well okay good on you for trying we could talk about the meaningfulness of high cholesterol right but that little bit the physicians committee for social responsibility right has filed a complaint against Texas Beef Council for misleading advertising or what have you. Well, first of all, the Physicians Committee for Social Response, you know, for whatever, they've got less than 5% of their membership are physicians. <laughs> so that sounds a little misleading. Also, they're an animal rights group and a front group for, um, you know, vegetarianism. Um, they don't want animal agriculture. They're not real upfront about that to the general public. Um, so um, there, there's a certain amount of this that is going to take more than just the industry. Um, but I do think that, as I've tried to say to people, that everybody eats when you've got over half the adult population being diabetic or pre-diabetic and when 60% of adult Americans have one or more chronic illnesses, um, we need to find ways to bridge the, the gap between producer and consumer and producer is all the way from cow-calf to retail sales. Because um, there's, there's just this crying need to get this information out there. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times I've spoken to producer organizations where what I'm sharing with them is what I got from Gary Taubes or Nina Teicholz or any number of other people. Um, and it's new information to them. And it's like, how does this happen? Um, and then we have the advertising campaigns where it's 29 lean cuts of beef that belong in your heart healthy diet because they're lean mm -hmm. and I see this very earnest young person who's working in doing uh, public service videos uh, where it's a cooking demonstration so to make ground beef an even healthier part of your heart healthy diet take your 90-10 ground beef, brown it, put it in a colander, drain it, now pour boiling water over it <laughs> to remove even more of that fat, to make it, you know, so it's like, um, I, I understand, I think, the reality of the marketplace, right? They can't be seen to be too far away from where the, you know, accepted nutrition wisdom is, but my point to them is, so if I'm right and there is a tipping point approaching, how are you preparing yourself to meet the reality of that market? Because mm -hmm. it's coming. I'm convinced of it. Um, you know, so.
No, I would agree. I think like, uh, you know, there's certainly, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's really, you know, I get surprised by it, but then I don't at the same time when you see some of that advertising still around where, you know, they're advertising low fat milk or, you know, like, like what you said, the 90, 90, 10 beef and, you know, leaning things out and, and then still connecting that with like a healthy heart. Um, you know, it's, it's something that just kind of makes me wonder how much people are paying attention and how much people are more or less just going about their day and accepting what they're hearing. Cause like, if you listen, you hear this stuff, you know, 10 plus years ago and start to connect those dots. And, um, you know, I'm optimistic cause I think, you know, the more like, you know, Tim Noakes and, uh, that sort of, uh, outspoken, uh, individual who actually has, you know, the credentials to kind of, um, speak to this stuff then you know, the more people are going to start to kind of figure things out and then when you, when you look at like what you mentioned with 50 percent of the population being pre-diabetic or type 2 diabetic it's you you have to ask yourself what are we doing wrong and you know if, if we're doing things even remotely correct you wouldn't have half the population with like a very much a dietary related disease so um it'll be it'll it'll be interesting to see kind of how things kind of evolve and how the marketing kind of changes you definitely can see some of the marketing change but it's i think at this point it's more or less some of the smaller brands that are doing that type of marketing because they realize their audience is still probably in the minority um but uh we'll see how that changes in the next few years well i i, I yeah and part of so the part of the concern is is how does this if we're right Okay, should always say that. Sure, yeah. um, then how how can this be made accessible to more people? Mm -hmm. So how do economic realities play in you know the the food choices, the the food preparation choices? You know, people living lives that are different than the one I get to live. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, single parents working two jobs trying to make things work and then what I mean so so that's part of why I really want to push back hard against anything that would get somebody away from the idea that if they went to the supermarket and shop the outside of the supermarket that cliche right mm -hmm. don't, don't go don't go in the middle that's where the bad stuff is but on the outside that's where you can find the meat and dairy and poultry and and eggs and if you want fresh vegetables and that stuff but again how, how does how is that supported for some people um, and again for convenience sake we have people who are trying to say well this processed meat and as somebody pointed out to me just here recently well what degree of processing are we talking about ground beef right because very few people go out in the field with a fork and knife and go macking on the cow you know it's yeah. like there's some processing here we'll accept and other we won't and so then you can look at um there's there's a delicatessen up in portland that's my favorite place in the world to go to and they make virtually all of their smoked and cured meats and so i just sit there and try not to drool on the glass of the display case and i'm waiting my turn one time and a lady next to me is there waiting and she says oh it all looks so good i said yes it does and she said well but it's also bad for you Okay, so I started on the, but saturated fat isn't a problem. And she's, oh, I know that. Really? <laughs> well, then what's the problem? Oh, it's also processed. Really? Well, I mean, you know, what, what about nose to tail eating? Where do you think that stuff goes? I mean, it's, that's part of the harvesting process, right? Um, People have been concerned about nitrates in their, you know, cured meats, right? And and now we understand that that isn't an issue. But now you can see people who are, you know, buying specific products because of label claims. And again, I, I think that the marketplace responds, but the market, the 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 purchasing behavior has been too influenced by a lot of false narratives. 
and and we need to get people to feel more confident in you know, buying what they can afford, what they prefer. If people think that they're going to be making some, you know, world-saving impact by buying one product over another, I would urge them to look into it a little bit deeper, uh, or perhaps figure out what the difference is between you know the one version that's making that claim and then the commercially available option and saving that difference and at the end of the year make a contribution to heifer international or habitat or something that's going to bring safe drinking water to people that haven't yet gotten it or i mean th th there are there are ways to make that kind of impact and we should all be looking for those but as Adele says, Americans love the idea of saving the world by shopping. And it really doesn't work. You know, so <laughs> if that's your goal, find a way that does work. Yeah, Peter, I, I, you know, just uh, one of the things about labels, you know, as you probably know, that a lot of the labeling can be, you know, there's a lot of loopholes to get around some of the labeling. So you don't really know what you're buying, whether it's grass, you know, whether they say grass fed or grass finished or natural or organic, those are all kind of artificial labels, and there's a lot of ways to get around that. Um, the other thing is, you know, just in general, you know, we are clearly a grain-based agricultural society where we live off of, you know, a few, you know, what, what is it, soybeans, wheat, and corn, I mean, that, and, and sugar, I mean, that is, that is what is subsidized, and what are we going to, how are we going to get away from that? Is it possible? Can, is, there, is there a way to transition away from that? Is that, is that just an impossibility that we're never going to get away with? Because we're, now we're just exporting all that stuff. We, you know, we're going to feed the world. We're going to save the people from starvation by giving them obesity and diabetes. And I, I, just, I, just, I just think we've got to, you know, we've got to figure out how do we, how do we, how do we change that narrative? I mean, is, is it even possible? Do we, is the will there? Yeah, so big questions. Um, first of all, we're a net importer of organic food. States. So if somebody's buying organic because somehow they, th you know, it's like we're in, so, all right. Um, the, the soybeans you brought up earlier, uh, soybeans produce oil and then you have the meal that goes to feeding animals, but it also goes to feeding humans, right? So a lot of soy protein ends up, so no whole soybeans end up in a rumen. Um, there's too much fat. The fat content of a ruminant's diet has to be below six percent, or or it, uh, bad things happen. Um, so, I what was the, the the thing that got posted a little earlier about uh, fifty nine percent of our calories in the U.S. are coming from added sweeteners, added vegetable oils, and um, then cereals. I, I think that's what we're yeah, looking at. I, yeah, I think I think yeah, that vast majority of our diet is is that it's basically wheat, sugar, and vegetable oil. I mean, that, and, that's and, and that eighty some percent of our calories are coming from plants uh, already. So, um, in in terms of well, let, let's take a step back and and think it was only after World War II that we had refrigerators in the home become a possibility. You know, we had to complete rural electrification. We had to, you know, there were some things, but, but all that's relatively recent innovation. And so fresh meat being available and being, you know, that, that's relatively new. A um, hundred years ago, uh, we were still largely dependent on uh, draft animals for our tractors. So a quarter of our farm had to be dedicated to growing fuel for our tractors, right? Yeah, so we're still rattling through some of these transitions, um, but the, the availability, uh, somebody, Matt Ridley, a rational optimist, um, published just what's, what has happened in terms of how little we have to work in order to get an hour's worth of illumination and what that hour's worth of illumination means in terms of all that you know that impact i'm trying to put things together so we can look at you know i don't know a pound of animal protein or you know what what have you because it's 
relatively inexpensive for us now to get that. Well, okay, what does that enable? Um, part of what we're facing now is that in 2050, the UN is projecting that we're going to have to, there's going to be an increase in demand for animal protein of 66%. Now that's based in part on what they say is a healthy diet, so it's probably going to be more. Right? So, so there's that going on. Uh, I think Georgia Eid in her Breckenridge talk um, put up a figure saying that of all the people in the world who are following some form of a vegetarian, you know, slash vegan diet, only 5% of those people can afford to do it. You know, they're doing it out of choice, is what she said. 95% are doing it out of necessity. So the question is, how can we change that? going forward and how can we do that in a way that protects and arguably enhances the environment and if we can step away from some of the the romantic pictures and some of the narratives you know the pretty red barn being the image of farming which it hasn't been now for several decades the reality is that over the last 30 to 40 years there's been tremendous improvement in terms of water use efficiency reduction of impact on the environment feed use efficiency and um, you know what, what in the United States we have 10% of the world's cattle but we produce 20% of the world's beef so could we leverage that appropriately in other parts of the world it may be different species both of feed and of livestock. But in some of these parts of the world, we've got other issues like stable government, mm -hmm. you know, property rights, uh, you know, peace. Uh, these sorts of things also need to be sorted out as we try to help our brothers and sisters around the world flourish. And uh, again, I, I think we have these, these primary values in play in our conversations today, one of which is we want, to, we want to limit humans' impact on the world. An alternative is we want to maximize human flourishing around the world. And if you focus on limiting the impact, you won't get to the flourishing. But if you focus on the flourishing, you will get to the reduced impact. Because prosperous societies, ones that arguably don't have to squander so much wealth on treating chronic illness, just to name one, um, they can afford to invest in conservation and things to do with environmental protection. In many parts of the world, that's a luxury they can't yet um, afford. So, so again, I, I, um, if, if, if you find yourself having a conversation about sustainability and all that's being discussed is items of an environmental nature, then just know you're not having an honest conversation about sustainability. That true sustainability has to also beyond environment include factors of society and um, economy and and those three all have to be part of this conversation mm -hmm. yeah that you you led into the last question I kind of had too and it was uh, it changes gears slightly um, but and if it's something that's off your radar at the moment no worries uh, but I've, I'm always interested in you know, and we've certainly highlighted it a bit with this conversation. We talk about beef primarily as like the meat source, but you know, certainly there's more than that. But really, in the grand scheme of things, a very limited supply of the types of meat that we would have available to us as a human race. Um, when you do go into the grocery store and you walk through the grocery store, and certainly you see beef, pork, variety of fish, and, and that sort of thing, uh, you know, chicken, um, and then you kind of look at things in terms of 
what our balance is in the environment and what animals are overpopulated or underpopulated is is that something that we need to focus on too as we go forward is kind of getting rid of this like stigma of some animals are edible and others are not like some some are meant to never be eaten and some are meant, are essentially born to be eaten well i, I so what what was mike eads line at one talk that if california condors had been tasty they never would have become endangered. Um, it, it's a bit harsh, perhaps, um, but I, I think that, yes, the, the cultural issue can't be ignored as we look worldwide or even as we look within our diverse, relatively diverse population in the United States. So I, I think, um, Sean, you've said, obviously, everybody in the world isn't going to eat beef. Um, that's okay. Um, the, the issue I think for me, and, and I'll come back to some of the issues that I heard in your question, Zach, but if it's true that the human diet ought to be, ought to contain more animal products than currently is imagined to be healthy and in that up to and including exclusively so, how are we going to produce them? How are we going to do that in a way that allows for access to that worldwide? So um, I, I think that you know this this projection of two billion more people by 2050 that train's in motion. That train has left the building, right? There's nothing we should entertain in the way of ideas as to change that. Um, there is the thought that it won't get much higher than that, and, and um, that, again, is against the narrative. And then there's a possible problem beyond that because we then have this aging population with the collapsing younger population underneath it. That isn't an unmixed blessing. Um, then you've got the, the fact that humanity's diet is already plant-based. The majority of calories and the majority of protein in humanity's diet is already coming from plants. And again, I would suggest that needs to change. Um, there's been work done where giving women one egg a day as a treatment, right? one egg a day, prior to conception and then through um, birth, their children ended up with larger brains than women in that same environment who didn't get that very modest kind of intervention. And you're, and you're, pro a, Peter, and you're probably talking in, in like developing nations where that sort of intervention has been done, I would assume. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and then, of course, the irony is that we have people in, in the, quote, developed West who would be trying to, by choice, follow a plant-based diet. Uh, and then there are issues that could be manifest. We know that um, these, so we know that we've had really confusing conversations about the value of nutrients from animal products versus nutrients from plant products. And yet people that I respect say that they're is no essential nutrient in the human diet that cannot be supplied by animal products. Well, so how does that shift the conversation? You know, depending on the situation, you know, I, I can point to the studies that show that in California, more protein and protein of a higher quality can be produced by growing alfalfa and feeding it to a dairy animal than by growing wheat and feeding it to human beings. So how are we going to weigh all these things going forward? It seems to me that our nature is of an organism that consumes animal products. Now, we can consume other products, too, arguably to varying degrees. And, you know, there are certain things that I think just nobody should argue for in the human diet. But, um, so how are we going to produce that food 
in a way that, like I said, protects and arguably even enhances the environment, not just in the United States, although we will continue to do that because we have a significant part of the world's cropland as well as rangeland and a small part of the world's population. Um, so we will continue to be able to um, support more than our population in terms of food production. Um, and to not do that, to shut that down in some way, doesn't mean that you know nature will flourish. Um, grassland, if we don't graze it or burn it, loses productivity, loses vitality. It loses ecological diversity. Um, so, again, we, I, I live in this weird world where I, I, I hear stuff all the time and it's, no, no, that's, that's not right. And, and it starts on the nutrition side and it runs through agriculture into ecology. And um, it's just, uh, it's good to see people like yourselves that are pushing because I think that that's those those kinds of outliers are the ones that again part the expression the herd looks at <laughs> and and then they say well wait a minute what what what's going on over here um, you know as as bad as we are with celebrity sport as part of celebrity um, so I I think that what is happening should lead to people questioning, well, why, why do I believe that? Who said that? Where's the evidence that supports that? And, and evidence isn't just a newspaper article or a blog post or, you know, whatever. Evidence to me is something from research that I can then read and see what you did. And then see if there's other stuff that kind of aligns with that. So it's not one study, it's a story that, that leads us in, in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, Peter, I think one of the problems I have is people seem to think that, that the science has been settled and there's no reason to question it anymore and we can just accept what's been done, particularly when it comes to nutrition. And I, and I think we have so much to learn. And I think we're so far... Uh, away from, from what we what we need to know to do this stuff, it's, it's and it's a very difficult task, and I don't envy the people in this in the research doing that because they're answering almost impossible questions. You know, they're well, trying and, to and, out. And, yeah, just the, the very statement the science is settled is self contradictory. I mean, it's, that that's just no, it's <laughs> so wrong. And yes, exactly, there are some disciplines that we could look to, and it's pretty obvious and. And I think that there's a growing awareness that this is a problem in many disciplines where research can't be replicated. Uh, one of the things that I like to point out to people is, look, consulting nutritionists and veterinarians get fired every single day, right? Because if I've got a dairy with 100 or 200 or whatever the number of head of milking cows is, and all of a sudden, their milk yield drops tens of pounds per head per day. I'm going to see that immediately, and I'm going to start talking to the nutritionists and say, what did you change? And the way that conversation does not go is that nutritionist does not blame the cows. <laughs> <laughs> right? It may be, he may think it, but he best not say it especially if he's just made some kind of change in the ration. And so then they begin testing components and they begin to re-examine the ration calculation. And in that situation, we've got a good, you know, we've got much better estimates of what's going in and what they're eating or not eating out of what's been fed and therefore the production than we'll ever have with human beings. And, and you know, so if, if the research points to something and it doesn't pan out in hard numbers, then we have really quick reasons and justification for questioning that work. 
and people's livelihoods are at stake here. So th that seems to me at least to be a fundamental difference between animal science and stuff dealing with human beings, whether that's medical science or nutrition. Um, but it's the, the issues, and, and, and unfortunately, and with all due respect, um, physicians have made a great name for themselves by coming up with their new interpretation of what agriculture ought to be doing, right? And you need this kind of food or that kind of food or whatever, you know, with this kind of label claim. And, and my comment back to them is, well, when medical error is the third leading cause of death in the United States, then you can come talk to me about fixing our broken food system. Right. But I mean, 300,000 people a year in the United States die due to medical error. And the rate of harm is 10 to 12 times higher. And that's before we've ever started to dig into, well, what about the ramifications of the crappy diet guidelines, right? Because that, that, that is only behind heart disease and cancer. So some portion of that's diet, right? maybe not all of it, and then we've got kidney disease, and then we've got all these other diseases that are part of this issue of bad dietary advice, and everything that I'm seeing is strongly suggesting we need to be eating more animal products, not less, and how, how are those going to be made available to a population? Yeah, Peter, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm a proponent of eating animal products. <laughs> right, right. Anybody's going anybody's gonna to question me on that. But, you know, and, and I agree with you. And, and again, I've never came out there saying that everybody in the world needs to eat a, a fully 100% animal based diet. But I do think, and I agree with you, and, and the point that you made about Dr. George E. talking about 95% of the world's vegetarians and vegans are done out of because they're forced to, not because they choose to, because they just don't have the economic uh, wherewithal to afford animal products, either either individually or in their society. You know, if we look at, I would imagine the subcontinent of India would be where, where the majority of them is probably some of the uh, poor African nations. And so, you know, I know there's been interventions where we've introduced animal product, whether it's a chicken or an egg, or if they're really lucky, maybe they can get a cow. That's made a dramatic improvement in their overall life and nutrition. And the question is, you know, you know, if we look at the worldwide consumption of, just say, beef as a product, it's pretty minuscule. I mean, I think we talked about that for us. Maybe per person on Earth, it's maybe an ounce a day or two ounces a day. It's, it's you know, of all humans, it's a very small amount. And I think to, to, to even – I think we, you and I did the math one time where we said, well, what would it take to get every human on the planet a pound of beef? You know, and then we said – you made some you made some projections that, you know, you'd have to do it based on U.S. production – you know standards because we got to get the efficiency up because these countries in uh, you know Asia and Africa and, and their 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 production is very inefficient. It's driving some of these environmental issues. You know we've got a billion head of cattle in India, if I'm not mistaken, and, and probably those are the places that really have to look at if we're going to look at it on a worldwide sustainable view. You know we can only as Americans, us three guys, we we have an impact in the U.S. But again, this is a worldwide. We talk about the environment; it's a worldwide issue. And, I, and again, I. You, know, you talk about political stability, economics, all that stuff that has to be in place. But you know, what would you, what would, if if you could control the the agriculture world, you're the king, you're the king of agriculture. How would you feed the whole world a pound of beef a day? What would you do? Yeah, if I were the king, I think I'd kill myself to do the world a favor. <laughs> um, so the we we have. We have a tremendous amount of – so if it were just so simple to go to wherever in the world and open up your you know, Crop Science 101 book and your Animal Science 101 book and say, here you go, sort it, great, just do this. Um, but it isn't because you know, there's going to be issues of, well, you know, in some parts of the tropics, you need different livestock species and you need different forage species. And in some parts, uh, you know, I'm going to Brazil in the beginning of June, and it's to a place where they have a very dry season and a very wet season. And they're relying on tropical grasses, and those grasses, if not managed properly, are very poor in digestible energy. 
it takes them about three years to get a calf to market and it takes us two. So, you know, how, and, and they're using, you know, mostly indicus cattle as opposed to taurus cattle. Um, and, and they tend to be more extensive systems rather than intensively managed systems. But there are these tremendous opportunities now today because we have technology for things like uh, portable fencing so we can control animals in terms of what bit of ground we want them on for how long so that they'll utilize the feed that's there uniformly, they'll deposit dung and urine more evenly, then we can move them on and that bit of ground can have a rest and regrow because it's, it's somebody said it's not the first bite that kills the grass, it's the fifth bite as it's trying to regrow. And, and as grass grows, the newer bit is the stuff that's coming up from the ground. And that's the bit that's very digestible and very attractive to animals. So they'll come back to that repeatedly. And you can only do that to a plant so many times before you weaken it because if the leaves are the solar panel plant then the stem base is the soul is the battery and if you graze too closely not only do you remove all of the solar panels but you've ripped up all the battery and now these plants die so these are the sorts of things that we now know what to do then you get involved in human psychology and why don't farmers do that and it's 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 a wonderfully complex system but it would have to be more improved utilization of the natural grasslands as well as looking at more in, in this country particularly and perhaps in others reintegrating livestock into the cropping systems we over the last several decades have separated those two to a large extent and now we're learning more and more about how having grazing animals on these cover crops or, or a, a crop grown after the cash crop actually produces a greater improvement in soil health than just the cover crop alone. And so we're, we, we need to find ways to get livestock back into farm ground. And that kind of reintegration, I think, will increase productivity as well. Um, you know, then you've got to get that product to market, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's not a technology question. It, it's, it's all of those other aspects that, that are going to come into play. I think a good place to start is convincing people in many places that this is what we need to accomplish. Right now, the noise is just the other way, right? And so you have very, you, you have philanthropic individuals who are making investments, but not in this. And, and that's part of my reason for advocating for a ruminant revolution, which is an allusion back to the green revolution of the 60s and 70s, which averted starvation for a quarter of humanity at the time. Well, that was about survival. A ruminant revolution can be about flourishing for more and more people. And, and one of the things I got from Matt Ridley's uh, book, um, The Rational Optimist, is more brains communicating is a good thing. More brains solve more problems. And we've got big problems coming. There's, there's no doubt about that. So I, I think that's why we need to find ways to to communicate this information, to get people excited about this possibility and the reality so that we can then get all of the resources together to help solve whatever these issues are in whatever location they are. Yeah, and, I, and again, I, I, not to hog all the questions, Zach, but I, I just, I've got a lot of, you know, because I get, to, I field these questions all the time, and I'm saying, hey, I'm not an agriculture ex expert. I don't have the, the expertise to do this, so I, I like to get some of this information. But, you know, I, again, we, the question becomes, do we have the land to do it? Is there enough pasture land to to make something like that happen? Where we said, uh, uh -oh. sorry about that. No, that's okay. So the question would be, 
you know, do we have enough land on Earth to feed every human being, assuming there's 9 billion of us in, you know, 2050 or whatever it's going to be, uh, do we have enough land on Earth to get every human a pound of meat a day, you know, whether it's beef or whatever it is? And that's, that's one of the questions. And then I've yeah. got some other follow-ons. No, so, so my short answer, as shocking as that might be by this time, is yes, we don't have the land. Um, a- absolutely. And if we don't have ruminant animal agriculture, we won't be able to feed the world because only a small portion of the Earth's surface is suitable for cultivation. And as the population grows, we're going to outstrip that resource especially for plant-only diets, right? Uh, something like six times as much is arguably available for production of ruminant animal agriculture of one kind or another if we look at forests plus grassland. So the answer is yes, and it won't necessarily just be ruminants, but um, absolutely. Another, Jack, do you have anything? Or I've got a couple. I don't want to keep no, you too long. Go, got you've more. you've addressed a few of mine, so we're all good. <laughs> so, so Peter, just and these are the typical questions. I know you've talked about them before, and I've talked about them before. But you know, one thing you know, and I talk, I put a post up on my Instagram about hormone. You know, we talked about you know you'd have to eat twenty seven cows a day to get the, the same amount of estrogen uh, that you naturally. Even you produce. couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, even I couldn't do that. But I mean. It, this is the thing we have this perception that these animals are implanted with hormones. Now I have a question for because I don't know the answer. Are the female, you know, the cows actually given testosterone too for growth, or is it just the male, the steers that are giving testosterone in, in that situation? It's just the steers. In other okay. words, the, the the bull calves that are castrated become steers, and they're the ones in the feedlot that can be given hormone implants. Gotcha. But the but the uh, female, the ones that are given estrogen. Uh, are, are the female cows anyway that are producing it naturally, correct? Or is it only yeah, the they're, bulls? They're producing it naturally. They're heifers. They're, um, yeah, so that's, it, you're just looking at steers when it comes to hormone implants. Right, and then I recently so, saw, and I think you sent me some of this stuff on antibiotic usage, and I think there was, in, is it 2017, they, they're in the U.S., they're making it so where, you know, they're, there's something called io, ionophores, which are antibiotics that are utilized for promote growth and that is going that practice is going away if I'm not mistaken they're only using saving the antibiotics purely for prophylaxis of, of infection and so on and so forth is that what can you speak to about that yes yeah, so there was a change I believe January of 2017 where um, a- antibiotics would no longer be used for growth promotion alone um, that there needed to be a um, or there needed to be a, um, a prescription couldn't just use these. Um, so there had to be a consulting veterinarian involved. Ionophores are a little different thing. They're, they're, they're a compound that has absolutely no use in human medicine. Uh, what they do, ironically, is depress the methane-generating bacteria in the room. And so, <laughs> yeah, so, so those then shift. So methane represents a loss of energy from the feed, and if you can depress their activity, that makes more energy from the ration available to the animal. But in terms of using other um, antibiotics solely for growth promotion, that that process has changed. And then there's all the issue, the, the, the practices of monitoring for residues, and, um, you know, for example, Every truckload of milk that shows up at the commercial test, a dairy, is tested before it's offloaded um, or before it's combined uh, with other truckloads. And if, you know, they now have rapid response tests for residues, and they're looking at for a panel of antibiotics and pesticides. And if any of those then pop up, that lot is condemned disposed of, traced back to the farm, and significant fines are levied. So um, there's a lot of monitoring and surveillance to ensure that what we're eating is safe. The other question I have is about water utilization, because you always hear these statistics that, you know, to make a pound of beef, you need like 700 million gallons of water. I'm exaggerating, but I mean, 
talk to that a little bit because, you know, I, I understand some of that, most of that water often is just rainwater. And, you know, and the cows urinate. And, do they, and when these cows urinate, I'm sure they urinate a whole bunch. Where does that water go? I mean, it's like this water is disappearing and never seen again. So can you talk about water utilization, what's really going on, where they get those numbers from, and what are the, what are the more realistic numbers? Well, so the, the wide variety – there, there, there are huge ranges, and I think I've posted something uh, before on this. The larger numbers are always including precipitation. So they'll look at how many acres it takes to produce a calf and to slaughter, and then what's the average rainfall. And an acre inch is 27,000 plus gallons of water. <laughs> well, so that's, and they'll say that all went to produce the steer. None of it infiltrated, none of it ran off, none of it evaporated, none of it produced plants that weren't consumed, right? That, that's how they do their um, uh, assumptions. Um, yes, an animal drinks water and then it respires water or it urinates or defecates. There's water in all those. That's returning to the environment. Some small portion of that, obviously, is still going to be in the meat, ultimately. Um, so that water was not destroyed. It's part of the water cycle process. Um, and in terms of scale and comparison, you know, municipal systems, leaks in municipal systems far outweigh the consumption of water in, in beef production, for example. But even there, there's significant interest in lowering the water use in the beef supply chain, most of which is in the processing end of things. Um, and then efficiency in, in irrigation when that's part of, you know, depending on the environment. Yeah, interesting, because we, you know, we hear all these, you know, it's, there's a lot of propaganda and there's a lot of noise out there and it's hard to, uh, and that's what most people hear because those are, you know, it's, it's the people that are screaming and the loudest get their message out. And I think that's a problem that, that, you know, there's not enough people saying, well, this is what possibly is really going on. And like I said, cows aren't alchemists. You know, there's 70% of their meat is, you know, 70% of our flesh is made out of water. So that's pretty much the net water that you're using to make grow that cow. The rest of it is, you know, like I said, it's recycling around. And so, uh, you know, maybe that water is no longer in a, in a, in a potable form, perhaps, but, you know, rainwater never is anyway. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just a uh, uh, funny way to look at things, I think. Well, and, and in some cases, it's actually, you know, so we've, we've got water that's made itself to a stream, and it's in the process of moving now out of that watershed, right? It's, it's not a good idea to have cattle walk into the stream and drink, but you can pump that water out into a trough, and those animals can drink that water again because they're able to tolerate water of a little lower quality than we are, right? And so now that water, instead of winding its way all the way back through the cycle, now comes back onto the land in the way of urine. So there may actually be this shortcutting of that cycle which again, people don't think about, don't consider. So um, the, I, I think that Gary Fedke did a good job of, of looking at the, the belief system that led to you know, how we come to believe that we should be eating plant-based diets as opposed to, but then there are all the other voices that come in there, and some of these are really well-funded. And, and so their voice is much louder than the small number would, would indicate. And, and part of it is, as I say, uh, a lack of experience. Um, so, you know, people believe what they hear. I think um, part of it also is people are busy, you know, they're facing whatever challenges they have in living their own lives. And some of this stuff you kind of be got kind of geeky or you know, be trained in these other areas to, to know some of this stuff. Um, and, and then you get to see what I see, which is people who know the environmental and agricultural side don't know the nutrition side, yet they're producing the, the, the food. So it's, it's not too surprising that a lot of these myths are out there. You know, part one, one thing I'll just try to leave, you know, there's a difference between 
uh, animal rights and animal welfare. A lot of people use those interchangeably. Um, animal welfare is the concern that everyone who's responsible in agriculture should be focused on. Um, animal rights is the propaganda. Um, you know, you don't get rights without responsibilities, right? There's, there's no expectation that these animals have responsibilities. They're doing what they do. Um, just like uh, animal fat and saturated fat are not synonymous. Just like pro animal protein and plant protein are not synonymous. But we've had these conversations um, that would lead people to believe that they are, and then when we speak, we may not be as as um, disciplined as we need to be so that we can make sure that the message is clear. Yeah, I know, I know, and I'll just... Uh... I know you've talked about the difference between animal protein and, and plant protein, and one of the issues is when they determine plant protein, they're looking at total nitrogen content, and, and that is not protein. That's not an amino acid. That is, you know, nitrogen has been fixed by the atmosphere, and it's not necessarily in a usable form that we, that we can utilize, and so I think they sometimes overestimate the protein content of certain plant foods. I'm not, is, that, is that what I understand? Am I understanding that correctly, Peter? Yes. Um, there's, there's a... There's a quality called crude protein and um, almost a hundred percent certain at this point that when you look at a label on a food product and it says protein that in fact is a crude protein value but I know for certain that you can look up the crude protein content of a um, hundred grams of cooked navy beans versus a hundred grams of cooked you know beef sirloin and what you find is very similar crude protein values maybe even a little bit higher by decimal you know tenths uh, for the beans the problem is as you said crude protein is total nitrogen content multiplied by 6.25 so we're assuming that that percent nitrogen that nitrogen all came from protein and we're going to assume that all that protein was 16% nitrogen. That's how we get that number. And that works okay with ruminant nutrition because, in part, ruminants can utilize non-protein nitrogen. So crude protein contains both true protein and non-protein nitrogen. So ruminants, again, another great value that they have is that they can convert non-protein nitrogen into high-quality animal protein. With beans going into humans, not so much. So the ratio of true protein to crude protein in beans is going to be somewhere below 57%. And for beef, it's going to be above 92%. And then the, the true protein is going to have a different biological value in the beans and in the beef. So uh, for that reason, we can confidently say that animal protein is more valuable in human nutrition than plant protein. Right. So, I mean, it's basically you're saying, you know, a large percentage of that is this unusable nitrogen that we find in the plant product. It's more bioavailable in the meat and it's in a better amino acid ratio. And I think that's, you know, again, I, I, I'm 100 percent, you know, behind the belief that animal protein is a better source of protein. I think that's, you know, I think there's a lot of people that, that a lot of people that will agree with that. And I think it's been demonstrated multiple times. But, you know, we always see these infographics put out by some of these vegan propagandists where they'll show broccoli versus beef and say, look, here's a here's 100 calories of broccoli, which may be, I don't, you know, 16 cups of broccoli. I don't know how many, how much, you know, they say this is calorie for calorie. You know, mm -hmm. and most of that's all fiber. And, and even then they may be overestimating the protein because it may just be crude protein. Yes, it, it, it almost certainly is crude protein. Uh, there was just something that floated by and said, but that's only if it's raw. If it's cooked, then it's poor. Um, you know, there's there's issues, as Georgia Ede can point out, about antagonists in terms sure. of nutrition from plants. Um, you know, if, if, if the statistics are right, you know, and NHANES data, 40% um, of 40% of adult Americans aren't getting enough protein in their diet, and most females over eight aren't getting enough protein. And there's two issues that would make me believe that's the, the reality is worse than those.
those numbers. One is their targets are probably too low. There's a lot of data about that. And two, con they consider plant and animal protein to be equivalent. So it's as bad as it is, it's probably worse. It's, you know, so um, if somebody is going to be trying to uh, follow a, a, or get significant amount of protein from plants, they need to be aware that um, they need to dig deeper into the numbers. They need to probably eat more or their target needs to be higher than, than what they've been thinking. Um, and, and so that's just information for anyone. And I, yeah. I think too, that like what you highlighted to me there, uh, Peter and Sean is like, you know, protein is just one piece to that bioavailability puzzle too. You can look at um, all sorts of different uh, nutrients that, that we require that are much higher in bioavailability when they're in the form of meat as opposed to, as opposed to plants. So like anyone listening who's like curious about that, if you know, it wouldn't hurt to take a look at some of that, like um, the bio, take iron, for example, look at the bioavailability of iron in liver versus spinach. And even though the label on spinach says there's much more iron in it, you know, look at, look at how that's absorbed and try to put that in context and get a kind of a better idea. And, and I think Georgia Ede on her last, or the talk at uh, Breckenridge, she showed an experiment where they, <laughs> probably not accurate to describe it this way, but they dosed people with oysters. Right, and then they measured the serum zinc level over time, and then they dosed people with the same amount of oysters, but with black beans. And their serum zinc levels were less than half the response from the oysters alone. And then they dosed people with the same amount of oysters, but with corn tortillas, and virtually none of the zinc was absorbed. So it not only you have availability from the plant, but then you've got competition against what otherwise would be a very available source. Yeah, I'm, 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 in, agree I'm in agree with that stuff. I, I've been saying that for a long time. The bioavailability is far superior in animal-based nutrition. I think that's pretty clear. Well, I think it's, we've been going about a good hour and a half. I don't know if Peter would want to worry out. Um, <laughs> Where, where where can people find you, Peter? I know you got at Grass Based on Twitter, and I, I know you're on Instagram a little bit now, and I know you got some speaking engagements coming up, so what else is what's, what Where can people find you? Well, those are the two primary ones. I keep saying that I'm going to get back to more active posts on my Grass Based Health blog. Um, I also have a Facebook page by the same name, so you can find Ballersted in a lot of places. Uh, look for me on uh, YouTube. If you find another Ballersted, probably let me know because he may be kin. Uh, there's not that many of us out there, but um, I'll be at uh, KetoCon. I'll be at Keto Fest. Uh, if anybody's going to be down in uh, Brazil, <laughs> the first full week of uh, June, I get to talk to people who are working in livestock cropping systems to try to get them aware of the value of animal products in human health and in those systems, which I'm quite looking forward to. Excellent. And folks, we will definitely put some of those links to Peter's uh, channels on the, in the show notes too. So you know, definitely head over and follow, follow him and uh, he, he does put out some interesting stuff so it's uh, just an additive to what what he's, he's talked about here today thank you gentlemen good thanks Peter everybody. thanks thanks for uh, seeing you. I've talked to you on the phone before it's good to see you live and hopefully I'll see you in real person one of these in the near future yeah I have, a, I have a feeling this conversation will generate some more questions so hopefully we can have you back on down the road love to thank you alrighty thank you very much hey folks Thanks again for tuning in to the Human Performance Outliers podcast. Just a couple quick notes before you leave. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at hpopodcast at gmail.com. That's hpopodcast at gmail.com. We're both also on social media. On Twitter, you can find me at zbitter. That's at Z-B-I-T-T-E-R. And you can find Sean at S Baker MD, that's at S B A K E R M D. We're both also on Instagram. 
where you can find me at Zach Bitter. That's at Z-A-C-H-B-I-T-T-E-R. And for Sean, it's at Sean Baker, 1967. That's at S-H-A-W-N-B-A-K-E-R, 1967. Thanks again for tuning in to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast.